U.S. militarism and Christian Zionism are the fuel for this genocide, make this genocide possible by arming um, Israel. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Spath. I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to welcome you to this, the next in a series of webinars, The Stones Cry Out Virtual Delegation, building on our in-person delegation to Palestine this past February and March. These webinars this summer are designed to inform, inspire, and empower our advocacy this coming September 23rd to 25th as we gather in Washington, D.C., for meetings, direct actions, demonstrations, and other important gatherings. We urge you to spread the word, the word widely and join us in DC September 23rd to 25th. I also wanna thank my partners for this series, Kairos USA's Mark Braverman and Doug Thorpe from the Episcopal Bishops Committee for Peace and Justice in the Holy Land, Diocese of Olympia as well as all of the sponsoring organizations listed here. We're delighted today to welcome three dynamic uh, U.S. activists from the Bay Area, Rabbi Lynn Gottlieb, Jewish Voice for Peace, Reverend Alice uh, Tanner, and Reverend Ranwa Hamami, a Unitarian Universalist Muslim social justice minister. Thanks. Uh, Thanks, folks, for being with us uh, today. I want to I want to just jump right into this. Uh, tomorrow is day 300, 37 weeks, almost three quarters of a year of Israel's genocidal assault on Gaza. I've been saying uh, this from the start. This is more than a war on Gaza or Hamas, more than a war on Palestine. Uh, it's a war on Palestinian history, tradition, culture a war on the very idea of Palestine itself, an attempt to erase Palestine from human memory, the very definition of genocide. Uh, your thoughts. Let's begin with you, Lynn. Well, thank you so much um, for hosting us. And it's a pleasure. It's, it's not a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be with my colleagues. It, it's always so hopeful um, to be with people that that I love and trust, who I've spent a lot of time on the street with, <laughs> and uh, who who dare to try to not only imagine a better world, but to um, employ strategy, tactic, uh, dedication to be samud as Palestinians say, to be steadfast in trying to. Uh, and and this genocide, which is a pathway to keeping everyone safe. I am so sorry for everyone's loss. Those of you who might be listening on the call uh, who have experienced uh, loss of life, the loss of life of loved ones, dislocation, and and so much more. And that is why we're here, because our traditions call us to prevent the loss of life and to center humanity in, in everything we do. And I, I believe that's probably enough to get, to get started. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Ranma? Thank you. Um, I, I echo... Um, everything that my uh, colleague and comrade in the streets, Rabbi Lynch, has just said. Um, and, you know, I, I think the maybe one element that I would add is that, you know, when people talk about the timeline of what's when everything started and using October 7th as a a fulcrum point or a starting point that was never the starting point of any of this. And it's, 
I remember hearing about what happened on October 7th and my biggest concern was what's going to happen on October 8th because we know exactly how the Israeli government and military operates in quote unquote moments of peace. And so when a moment happens that challenges their stronghold on a stranglehold, I would say, on the people of Palestine, we know that they're going to escalate it in, in horrific ways. And so that's why we were out there on October 8th, October 9th, October 10th, because we knew what was going to happen. We knew we would get to this point if we didn't at least attempt to challenge it. And so the grief and the rage that many of us feel in this moment is more than valid at this point. And it's so crucial for these moments now when we come together to remind ourselves that we are on the right side of history if we continue to resist this kind of reality. And as my comrade said, imagine and move towards that world where everybody is free. So thank you for providing that context. Thank you, Ranwa. Allison. I, again, my colleagues have, have said it well. Um, I, I think I want to name in this moment, um, I, my goal is to empower people to take action. However, I think the most important thing we can do, at least first and foremost right now, is to bear witness to the immense pain and grief and to allow it to evoke rage, to allow it to... Um, to almost just stun us into silence. How can this possibly be happening? And 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 the 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 prophetic, how long, oh Lord, how long? Um, so the role of bearing witness in this moment is so important. Um, the boy, the the role of speaking truth to to the the horrors um, of what's taking place. Um, and then, as my colleagues said, to to allow that ultimately to stir us to the streets, to taking action, to doing everything we can to um, uh, to challenge what's happening and imagine a better world. Um, but that that begins in just bearing witness. How can this moment be happening? And how can this 70 plus years of history be happening? Um, and uh, how can this uh, 400 plus years of history in this country be happening? Thank you, Allison. I know that the three of you are involved in, in, in a movement in the Bay Area called Interfaith for Ceasefire. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but I wanna ask about each one of your own activism. Ranwa, uh, uh, the Unitarian Universalists through the work of UUJME, Unitarian Universalists for Justice in the Middle East, have literally become a major voice uh, in the liberation struggle for Palestine among congregations in the U.S. Can you share with us the UU uh, recent uh, resolution overwhelmingly passed, uh, I believe it was just a number of weeks ago, and then other initiatives of the UUA and the UUJME? Yes, absolutely. So um, the we just had, um, technically last month, we're still in July, so in June, we just had our Unitarian Universalist Association's annual General Assembly, um, which um, combines sort of a like educational community gathering elements with our annual sort of business meeting as an association of congregations. And one of the um, uh, pieces of that business that we do are passing actions of immediate witness. And um, one of those actions of immediate witness that passed this year was uh, solidarity with Palestinians. Um, and this was something that was a grassroots effort, um, heavily uh, supported by uh, the resources and networks developed by the UU Justice, UU Unitarian Universalists for Justice in the Middle East community and, and folks involved in that. And so um, this uh, action of immediate witness or AIW as we call it, um, passed with over 70% of our assembly's vote um, and really charged our faith to 
move into greater solidarity with Palestinians, as the title calls, um, challenging the ways in which apartheid and genocide have been a constant um, experience within the uh, Palestinian uh, life, uh, within Palestinian life, and um, calling on you used Unitarian Universalists to engage in uh, different particular actions around witnessing, education, and organizing and advocating, um, including getting involved with uh, the work that Reverend Allison does with the Apartheid Free Communities Pledge, um, which I imagine she will share about at some point too. Um, so I am I will drop in the chat the link to that action of immediate witness, but it sort of serves as a model that um, folks, everyday people within your faith tradition, if you have those avenues, can do that organizing and relational work to transform what your broader association is. Me as a, an employee of our national association and beholden to what our congregations are sort of asking of us. And so when this kind of AIW passes, it allows me to lean into some of the more prophetic demands of our faith. Thank you, Ronald. Yeah, funny you should mention those apartheid-free communities because that's exactly where I was heading next. Uh, Allison, talk to us a little bit about the apartheid-free communities movement, uh, how many congregations, organizations, um, what are you asking, um, uh, how can folks on, on uh, this call and others uh, become involved? Uh, tell us a little bit about it. All right. Well, your work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Um, <laughs> the uh, the Apartheid Free Communities Initiative is growing the anti-apartheid movement that is working to name Israeli apartheid and to take action to cut all ties from it. Um, we are in a moment in which there is consensus among all major human rights organizations that apartheid is taking place, that Israel is enacting apartheid. Palestinians have long been saying this, South Africans have long been saying this, um, and, and now in addition, um, we have Human Rights Watch, we have Amnesty International, we have Bet Salem, um, and, and so the question is, what is the role specifically of faith communities uh, in, in working to end apartheid, recognizing this long tradition um, of faith communities in working to end South African apartheid and working to, uh, working to end uh, Jim Crow apartheid here in this country. Um, and so there is a, uh, a pledge working with Com asking communities, not just individuals, because many individuals in communities know exactly what's happening, yeah. um, but but people in the pews don't necessarily know, and 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 having difficult conversations is one of the things that this this pledge allows for. Uh, we are asking communities, uh, specifically people of faith, communities of faith, but all communities, solidarity communities can take a pledge. Um, I put the pledge in the chat, but let me take a moment just to read it because I think it is so powerful. Um, the Apartheid Free Pledge asks communities to affirm their commitment to justice, freedom, and equality for the Palestinian people and all people to oppose all forms of racism, bigotry, discrimination, and oppression. And of course, this includes anti-Semitism, this includes Islamophobia, all forms of racism, bigotry, discrimination, and oppression. And to declare themselves an apartheid-free community. And to that end, to pledge to join others in working to end all support to Israel's apartheid regime, settler colonialism, and military occupation language that Palestinians uh, have said, this this is the language that we understand for our situation and we are asking the larger community to name. We uh, I wanna recognize that several communities um, here have already taken the pledge. And if you have, maybe put your, uh, Put your community in the chat. Let's let's give a shout out to those who have been able to name this pledge, uh, and encourage uh, others to to do the work of um, of educating their community to take this pledge. On our website, we have an abundance of educational materials. We have a list of all of our uh, three hundred and seventy five communities who have taken this pledge. 
Uh, of those communities, 68 are congregations, full congregations who have made this commitment. 155 of them are faith communities, and our faith communities span um, Buddhist, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, interfaith, and several uh, combinations therein. Um, and so, um, and, and I think the last thing I want to say is it, even now as we're watching genocide unfold, um, in, in some ways naming apartheid is, uh, is tame. We need to be talking about genocide and yet apartheid naming it allows us to name one of the root causes that has brought us to this place and that must be undone to end the structural violence um, that has been and continues to take place against Palestinians. Thanks, Allison. <clears throat> Lynn, um, you've been a member of Jewish Voice for Peace. Uh, uh, I don't know for how long, but for quite a while. And uh, I also watched a YouTube interview with you about Jewish identity since October the 7th. It was a powerful, it was fascinating, interesting, powerful, powerful uh, interview. Uh, can you share a bit about what it means to be an American Jew since October 7th? Um, and also, uh, maybe your work in the work of JVP since October 7th. <laughs> busy. <laughs> really, yeah, really sure. busy. <laughs> for sure, huh? For sure. Um, yeah. Well, October 7th was uh, per, what was shocking for so many people. people on, on also on all on the spectrum of uh, people who are have been opposed to BDS, people who are, um, let's say liberal, liberal Zionist, uh, which who believe that, that the state of Israel can be reformed and there should be a two-state solution to um, the anti-Zionist community or non-Zionist community or just regular people who haven't really, you know, it hasn't really been on their radar much. October 7th was, um, as Rabbi B'nai Lapi says, was a crash moment for the Jewish community. And we can see that... Um, that everybody, got, so many people got activated and we're looking how to get activated. And this is where the decade or more of organizing of Jewish Voice for Peace was really important because we see that having a movement in place to move when crisis calls was profoundly important because we already had the infrastructure, uh, I'm not sure how many specific chapters we have any we have at this moment, but it's it's close to a hundred. We have the largest online uh, membership of any Jewish organization. And Jew Jewish young people in particular were were profoundly involved in the first large demonstrations that took over bridges and got into federal buildings and the White House and the Congress and student encampments. Um, and I think what is significant about this movement is clearly a solidarity movement. That is to say, it's centering the leadership of Palestinians. And it's also an intersectional movement, understanding the link between U.S. Uh, domestic and foreign policy and the ways that U.S. militarism and Christian Zionism are the fuel for this genocide, make this genocide possible by arming um, Israel and Israel fits into a larger strategic white supremacist goal. Why that happened is perhaps, you know, another question. I also want to just um, thank the people pre-JVP. I, I was involved in the Fellowship of Reconciliation for a long time. My work on Palestine started in 1966 and included taking 
uh, delegations to Palestine and Israel um, with the Fellowship of Reconciliation over the years. And I think that also uh, provided people with firsthand witness to actually see what is happening on the ground rather than relying only on trusted news sources of which there are <laughs> there are not very many so that that was part of the reason um to take people over to to witness so yeah it's it is um i'll try to be short with this you know before 1966 i want to clearly state and research has shown that the mainstream jewish community was pacifist pacifist they were peacemakers major leadership there was nothing in the profile of the jewish community which would regard ceasefire as an anti-semitic concept the opposite the jewish community by and large huge percentage of jews um over uh 85 percent of jews were de were democrats i think that's still probably true although it might have dropped a little bit um, but also were engaged in major frontline domestic issues of social justice and human rights. So maybe that's uh, a little bit of hope, but you can see that the impact of Zionism and Israeli militarism has had an enormous negative impact on the American Jewish community in terms of its capacity to respond. So I'm really thankful for JVP and other groups like um, If Not Now and, and so many other um, just regular activists all over all over Turtle Island and the world who are who are trying to stop this. Each one of you um, has promoted, and I believe uh, Lynn, you participated in a webinar about the recent documentary where the olive trees weep about Palestinian trauma in the West Bank and Gaza for the last 76 years, featuring psychologist and trauma specialist, Dr. Gabor Mate. This might be one of the more underreported, sadly, and lasting impacts of the genocide. In, in addition to the death and uh, physical injuries, the invisible bodily trauma, the hidden injuries, brain injuries, the increasing numbers of deaths by suicide, can can you talk a little bit about the long term psychological trauma and impact uh, for those who survive, uh, uh, Ranwa? Please. Mm. Yeah, and I just I think it's as you were sharing that element of the impact, my mind immediately went to um, Rabbi Lynn's comment about intersectionality and how our moments are deeply connected, our movements are deeply connected, because I think about the work that myself and others do around policing in the United States. And so thinking about what it is like to especially be a person of color or a Black person in the United States where institutions and policing especially are built to dehumanize and criminalize your very being and um, even eliminate your very being. And so I think about that in the as a, an intersecting moment um, movement because a lot of our US policing institutions are trained by the IDF or IOF um, and are uh, have that same philosophy and is that same philosophy exists uh, within the Israeli military and government around who Palestinians are in their mind's eye. And that dehumanization um, that treated as less than a whole person uh, has long standing generational impacts across generations from families who were displaced um, in the 40s and before, in the 1940s and before to, um, to today, where there is that cycle of displacement, that cycle of dehumanization, that cycle of no aspect of my identity or my personhood or my family is safe. And that 
is something that lives within our bodies and it's something that we carry we we pass on to our our children our grandchildren um you know i think about texts that we have seen my grandmother's hands or the body keeps the score these are are things that for us to atone for the harm that we have done to Palestinians in in generations and and decades past and today, um, this isn't about fixing what's happening right now, but also bearing witness to and continuing to be present towards the effects this is going to have for decades after after today. Um, there are five and six year olds who will carry this trauma forward if they survive will yeah. carry this trauma forward in their lives. And so how are we bearing witness to and caring for for their being after this moment? Lynn, thank you, Ranma. I'm I'm well aware of intergenerational trauma from working with survivors of the Holocaust. And what is so shattering um but but must be <clears throat> kind of researched and responded to is um, the positive and negative impacts of trauma. However, I think um, Gabor Mate said that we can no longer use the Holocaust as a kind of justification for what's happening now. And so I wanna say that um, both <clears throat> acknowledge the decades I've spent taking care of survivors in my community. And one of the ways that we did that was through culture, was through reclaiming culture, um, having a klezmer band, relearning dances that were destroyed in the Holocaust over a thousand synagogues, painted beautiful painted synagogues, burnt to the ground. So as a rabbi who studied this and tried to reclaim and, and sustain both Sephardic Jews and uh, and uh, Holocaust survivors and Ashkenazi culture in an assimilationist place, it is shattering <laughs> and heartbreaking to see um, the negative impact of colonialism on and and sort of tying our ship or the the sails of our ship to uh, to racist colonial. Um, genocidal uh, empire, the United States, the greatest purveyor of of uh, violence in in world history, as um, as Martin Luther King pointed out. So, yes, um, it will take lifetimes to to reclaim and and try to recover from the devastation that has been unleashed um, on an entire people. We know what that's like. <laughs> and and uh, it shows that, that you know, we, we basically lost any innocence that we felt or any sense of um, that we we were un we were going to be unscathed or we were going to become righteous because we suffered so much that is gone completely gone and um, this this will require the best of us in the future uh, people who are willing to overcome um, the past and to to humbly courageously. Um, and with love, develop a spiritual practice that allows for tshuva, for atonement, for reparations, for guarantees of non-repeat, and to keep centering uh, Palestinian lives in as we uh, as we continue the work of solidarity from this generation to the next. Allison. Uh, Rabbi Lynn, you uh, you taught me something really powerful about the impacts of traumatized people when seeing trauma uh, anywhere. I, I remember hearing you talk about seeing the the starving children of Gaza and how that invoked your own trauma from 
from the Holocaust images of starving children. And that that is just a reminder that trauma is not um, contained to a specific experience, but seeing trauma anywhere can trigger uh, the trauma that's been caused. And, um, and, and, and I think that's important to say because, um, because, because, uh, because traumatized people have trauma in common um, and need not be pitted against one another or, or get into any type of uh, trauma Olympics, um, uh, but indeed can be traumatized by other traumatized experiences that they're bearing witness to. Um, uh, so, so to lift up that level of intersectionality, uh, and then uh, you mentioned, um, reparations, and I really just want to underscore that because there's trauma that's taking place now that must stop and will have long-term implications. Uh, we can't address the long-term implications until we end the trauma and ending the trauma isn't just a ceasefire. It isn't just creating spaces of justice and equality, all of which are needed to then get to the, the, the lifelong, the generational work of repair and healing um, that, that needs to take place and needs to take place for Palestinians and needs to take place for so many uh, traumatized uh, peoples um, in, in this world. Allison, I'm going to come back to you with this and then let Lynn and Ranwa uh, uh, add their thoughts as well. Uh, a number of you already mentioned the, the intersectionality of liberation struggles along with the Pal Palestinian uh, one. LGBTQ plus rights, indigenous peoples, reproductive justice and bodily autonomy, uh, Black Lives Matter, climate justice, I mean, you know, on and on, right? Um uh, can you can you say more about uh, um, the intersectionality of these liberation struggles and how uh, how we must respond? And uh, you know, uh, justice is indivisible, is the way Dr. King puts it, is the way Angela Davis puts it. But but and this gets back to you know, whenever you have a structure that elevates a certain demographic, a certain group, and minimizes another, then you have oppression. And that exists in so many ways, um, but in so many ways, um, purveyors of oppression uh, are deeply connected and are using the same strategies, the same uh, tropes for, for oppressing people. And so to seek liberation, to seek human dignity for all people demands that we address the structure that dehumanizes people. And, and that happens uh, across struggles for human rights. Um, and, and, to, and, and because justice is indivisible, to, to truly seek human dignity and worth for all people means we have to challenge all the different ways in which uh, people are being oppressed. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, I try to put this into practice in my congregation in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is is now in its 40th year. Uh, it's thriving. Um, but and it has a Sephardic learning center, Casa de Sfarad, which is unique. In, in American Jewish congregations to be housed in a community that also includes an Ashkenazi community that that um, has a band, band called um, Nahalat Shalom Community Klezmer Band. We play Klezmer, uh, middle, uh, Swana, Southwest, um, Asian and North African Jewish music. Um, and, and we have dance. So what our own cultural reclamation was part of the work of our solidarity because we we also co-founded the Muslim Jewish Peace Walk, which went to 22 cities throughout the United States and Canada in addition, you know, something that started in Albuquerque. So I, I guess what I'm saying is that the more that we strengthen the communities that we ourselves are part of, and look at the way um, 
We want to reclaim our communities and, and dismantle racism, dismantle invisibility, um, take sort of nurture the cultural uh, achievements, poetry, dance, the music, our holy days, all of that is part and parcel of being good solidarity partners. So we don't go in with a salvational attitude, but we see really that our futures are tied together. And in order to really represent that, we engage in our own self-agency and healing and strength. Another piece is hospitality. Uh, we became a house of hospitality for lots and lots of different communities. And these these are all pieces of um these are all pieces of the work. It's not only out there, it's also in here. And um for my own work, I believe that putting art and transformational solidarity at the center of community life is a way to give people agency so that they have the strength and the courage to do the solidarity work that is required in these times. Thank you, Lynn. Ranma? Um, first, plus 1,000 to what both of my uh, colleagues have said. Um, and to, uh, to add to that uh, just a little bit, um, there is a quote that's often attributed to um, the uh, Mori indigenous, indigenous Australian uh, artist and activist, Lila Watson. If you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And it's often attributed to her, but she's actually shared that it came up as part of an Aboriginal rights group gathering, which I think is even more to the point mm -hmm. of this is a community and shared struggle. Yeah. And one of the pieces of this that you know comes up for me is that this is about claiming our power. When we're talking about how there are these intersectional oppressions it means that there's actually a broader community within which we can uh, connect and gather and recognize that if we are all being impacted by this large uh, system, our numbers are larger than the system, are larger than these intersecting oppressions. And so by recognizing our connections and how we are all struggling, we can actually recognize our connections and realize the different elements of power and resources we have you know and you know one of the very concrete ways in which i think about how this can happen you know we have our um i almost wore this shirt but chose not to the shirt that says no funds for genocide on the front and then it says invest in healthcare housing and i can't remember what the third one is but you know thinking about how funds that are going to fund a genocide can be reinvested in our communities to, and and broader communities, not just within the U.S., but can be reinvested within our broader world to provide reproductive justice, access to care. That means reproductive justice, access to housing. That means housing security, um, and and so on and so on. And so it's it's really about recognizing how these connections between our struggles can help us challenge what is at the core of them, which is this dehumanization, is this attempt to separate our existence from one another. And so this is really an opportunity when we name those connections between our struggles to say, no, we're in this together. And our liberation is inherently connected to one another. Lynn, some of the some of the real unsung heroes, uh, in addition to those medical personnel on the front lines, um, are the journalists and bloggers and photographers uh, and others who continue to post images, videos, and stories from from Gaza itself. We know, right? Israel's targeting Palestinian journalists. Over a hundred, hundred and twenty now have been murdered since October seventh. No. Western or uh, uh, other journalists are allowed in the Gaza. Uh, there's a war on truth uh, by Israel with U.S. media 
complicity doesn't doesn't capture uh, the strength of what I want to say. But with the U.S. media complicity, even the so-called liberal corporate media, an oxymoron, of course, um, a war on truth. Uh, talk a little bit about talk a little bit about that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> there's a war there's a war on um there's a war on people's experience like there's there this is don't believe don't believe your lion eyes <laughs> you know what you see right well this is why um this is this is why i feel it's really important to to have um uh, to to promote to make spaces for Palestinian voices whenever we can, because um, we need to be the channels for people who are directly experiencing and firsthand responders who are who are directly experiencing um, these forms of genocide, and we cannot confuse U.S uh military interests um with how militarism and how this this approach to life impacts people <clears throat> so bringing people into our churches our mosques our faith groups um in all kinds of ways uh palestinians speakers films there's so many right now this is where the uh, Olive Trees Weep was such an important film. We need to be doing that work. We need to be generating as much social um, content and relationship building. I, I've always been struck by the fact that um, when I brought um, George Rishmaui, George S. Rishmaui, <laughs> there's like 57 George Rishmaui, <laughs> <in the floor. laughs> and it's a very <laughs> popular name. Um, but George Eshish Maui, who has spent his life as well trying to build bridges um, in, in Bates of War. There's so much work there that I, I, is so important to talk about. Um, when I invited him to speak at my congregation, he said, and many Palestinians said, this is the first time a Jewish congregation has ever asked a Palestinian to speak without having to have two sides address like they're like you know it's like you can't talk to a black person unless a white person is present or you can't talk to a woman unless a man gives their side of the story i mean it's just ridiculous so um, so i think bringing creating those relationships without taxing people too much but to help um build the a good solidarity rather than a salvational solidarity and to give people access to information that they don't have, that's that's part of activism's job. And um, I, I've i lost people this time around. Uh, one, a journalist friend who I, I just haven't heard from, I haven't been able to find out if he's still living. And it's just, it's so devastating to know that people's entire families are no longer and i know from holocaust survivors from being so close with people who had that experience in the past that how that impacts the rest of the community not just that family but the entire community it's it's a disgrace a disgrace and we should stop arming israel today Carol, if, if Kamala Harris really wants to make a difference, stop arming Israel today. I think for my my own sense of things, that she's the next person that we need to invite into um, the truth. Ranwa? Oh, invite into the truth. Wow. Um, that's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a word right there. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think like there again, talking about the inter like bringing it back to the intersections of movements and and how all of these issues are connected. We're at a point where what we have been told is the story of our world is being challenged by the people who were erased in that story. 
And so we're seeing that when it comes to indigenous communities here uh, in what is called the United States, we're seeing that with the indigenous communities in Palestine, we're seeing that all over the world where there are people who are saying our stories were never actually included in this sanitized, whitewashed version of the world. And so we are now being charged with and invited into understanding a different way of seeing not just the oppressions of the past, but the possibilities that lived within that past and the possibilities that live within our present and our future. And so when we're talking about what we're seeing in mainstream media, which frankly, what I'm seeing reported is a lot better than what we would have seen 10 years ago, because it's just so horrific what is happening that they cannot continue the lies. Um, what we're seeing in mainstream media isn't necessarily the narrative we need to be listening to right now. There are, and there, I don't have the text with me right now. I'll pull it up from my bookshelf if I need to, but there are um, ways in which folks have documented sort of the ways in which these, these stories compound on each other, these lies compound on each other. And so how are we unearthing what is actually the the truth beneath them? And it's, it's hard work because within ourselves, we embody some of those lies or we find safety and a sense, a false sense of safety in some of those lies. And so how are we also doing that internal care work for ourselves and each other as we realized what I thought was keeping me safe is actually causing harm to another being or to another person and so there it is an educational it is a spiritual journey it is a, a shared uh work of transformation of ourselves and the world that we need to engage in and starting to realize there is more truth out there allison i think the only piece i want to add is that unlearning what I've learned as a good Midwestern white girl where I grew up has been liberating, has been able to connect me with humanity in ways I was never taught I was allowed to. Um, the, 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 the diminishing and truncated experience um, of, of receiving all the lies um of of superiority is is so damaging um for for everyone uh whatever whether you're in the category of the elevated uh or the subjugated and i i just the 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 invitation of unlearning um has has been so healing for me um hard work um, and a lifelong journey. Um, and, and it takes place through listening and elevating um, the voices, the stories, the peoples, the cultures that, um, uh, that don't often um, or, uh, that don't often get uh, lifted up. And, and, and often you have to do the, the searching um, so that you can listen. Um, and that has what has brought some of my own repair and healing uh, in the process. I want to. I want th this question to take a look at what's happening here uh, in this country. On the one hand, we have the defeat of Jamal Bowman in New York, the the rise of white Christian nationalism, the implementation of the IHRA definition, Netanyahu receiving fifty two standing ovations in Congress, and more. On the other hand. We had the International Criminal Court and International Court of Justice rulings during Netanyahu's speech to Congress last uh, week. Over half of the Democrats didn't attend. And uh, our friend Rashida Tlaib, representative from Michigan, held a, a bold and courageous sign uh, for all to see. Thousands protesting outside, Jewish activists in the Capitol Rotunda, uh, just uh, during the Christians United for Israel conference the last two days, Mennonites leading the way with all kinds of demonstrations, students on campuses, and more. 
it used to be that I thought Congress was occupied territory and I just ignored. Uh, but there's something happening in the, in the country. And uh, I guess I'd like for you all to give us your assessment of what's happening here with regard to Palestine and Israel. And Allison, let's come back to you. Um, well, for absolutely, yes. I want to name that this is also happening around racial justice in this country. This is also happening around um, uh, sexual justice, justice for GLTBQ um, communities. So um, again, to, to say how um, it, it, it's, it's the same people trying to suppress multiple different groups. Um, having said that, um, we are in a moment of of great struggle for who this country will be and who this country will be for. And there are lots of different stakeholders and lots of different stakeholders are doing what they can to either maintain power or to move us into uh, more fully embracing what, uh, uh, what the what the um what the idea of freedom for justice at, for all really might look like in this country uh in ways in which we have never fully experienced it um to this question about these chaotic and and, and first of all you know my faith tradition uh it's from chaos that life comes so there's real opportunities here and i i i like to lift up um the words of nura Arakat. I, I heard her a few months ago and she she talked profoundly about, and this might have even been before October 7th, um, she talked profoundly about how, uh, when it comes to the truth of what's happening, she said, people on the streets know what's happening. Yeah. The researchers and the academics know what's happening. Um, where we see this struggle being fought is in the halls of Congress. And that is the last power hold um, um, and so, so there's, there's this grasping for power, um, in, in this space and, and it has severe consequences. We need to take it seriously. Um, but, but the hope that this is the ultimate sphere in which, um, truth is being contested because it's so clear in so many other spaces, um, I find both hopeful and, um, pressing because of the urgency of um of both what's taking place, its consequences, and what can be um from the fissures we see from um from what used to be. You know, um thank you, Allison, for that. I had a conversation with Representative Rashida Talib uh in March, and she said, I'm almost quoting here, the vast majority of members of Congress know what's happening. Knowledge isn't the problem, will, the will to act is the problem. I mean, that's almost an exact quote. Uh, and so I find that very sadly enlightening, you know, uh, uh, enlightening too. Lynn, please. We need movement strategy, right? We're, we got to talk about power here. Um, it's true. It's not, I mean, if people want to know, they know, and you can imagine that um, unless you willfully don't want to know, um, the information is certainly available to members of Congress, but uh, we need movement strategy. <laughs> um, they have movement strategy. They've had movement strategy for the last 50 years. That's why we're in this moment. They have they start with local communities. They go after school boards, city councils, uh, state legislator legislation, um, you know, so th there's there's kind of a track and this 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 is happening. We, we can see it happening um, right before us. So we need a movement strategy that addresses power and where the points of power are. And we have to turn on the heat. Now, turning on the heat with Congress is a really thankless task. <laughs> and it is. <laughs> It develop it means developing relationships. It means developing relationships with the press, your local press. It means developing relationships and getting a sense of what interests the local press. Um, some places that's easier to do than others. Certainly, uh, 
we figured out how to do it in Albuquerque, New Mexico. When I was there, we were in the news all the time. We generated uh, conversations about Palestine in the news, <laughs> which is kind of amazing. So how to use power, how to apply pressure is something that we can learn from JVP, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, um, and other organizations. How do we develop the skills to be powerful um, and to exercise our power? This is what nonviolence is about. This is why learning congregations and faith communities are the perfect place to study the tactics of nonviolence, to, to give your communities the opportunity to be creative, to exercise their, um, their, their ideas, to put them into practice. Um, I recently wrote a book after October 7th called uh, Replanting Seeds of Jewish Revolutionary Nonviolence. Um, for this very purpose, it's like, yes, we can lament, we can rage, we can feel righteous anger, but we need to apply pressure. And this is where the student encampments were also brilliant. They created the conversation that we, and the, uh, the desire for divestment and transparency. That's not a one-off. We have to build on our achievements and we can only do that if we're organized everywhere. We're organized locally. We're organized in our faith communities, which is what we represent. And that is what Interfaith, um, the Interfaith Network that we created started. That's um, chair of the board of Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. That's what we do also. We map it out and we figure out uh, where we're going to apply the pressure and how to apply the pressure. And and that doesn't mean that we're ugly toward people, but we do know how to apply pressure. Ron? Uh, there's 10,000 ways I want to take this question. <laughs> um, you know, you were talking about how, um, particularly I'm thinking about um, Reverend Allison's response. And um, there is a book that just came out from Prentice Temple, who is one of the original um, founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, where they talk about, um, you know, in 2020, we were at sort of this precipice of racial justice. And like, are we going to all jump in together? And we did it. We were so close, but we did it. Um, and so we're at another sort of precipice around Palestine and around our the global policing and around just our shared struggle for humanity. And whether we're looking at Congress, whether we're looking at our, our broader um, ways in which we organize and in our power, we're coming towards a precipice together. And are we going to jump in? What is it that we are afraid of if we are what is it that we're scared of happening if we jump in? What are we going to lose if we jump in? And so having those really hard conversations is really important in this moment because we are so close to breaking open something different in our world. I also think about, I can sometimes be a little bit of a, um, a jaded organizer around organizing uh, through Congress or through established political power. Um, and so I, I think about the Movimiento de Pobladores in Chile and their framework of organizing, of organizing with the state, against the state and outside the state. And so, you know, pushing Congress, pushing our political leaders is something that is absolutely essential in this framework. And then also recognizing there are other places for us to collect our power and to build our strategy. Those of us organizing outside of the state, creating the spaces that are truly liberatory, that care for one another, looking at our disability justice communities around what it means to create spaces where everybody is whole, everybody can thrive. And so how are we creating that shared strategy that takes all of these different tactics and moves it towards a concrete goal? Um, it, it's where we come 
we find ourselves in these moments regu regularly as people with a more progressive or more liberatory lens on how we can be together, but something stops us. And so I think we're at this moment of how can faith communities, how can people with shared values and shared purpose have that hard and liberating conversation about what it is we need to take that leap into what is possible. It's something we don't know what that looks like yet. And it's scary, but it can also be incredibly beautiful. So that's one of the thousands of ways I want to take that question. <laughs> I'm aware of the time. Um, one more question for you all, uh, all before we have your closing comments. Uh, and there's probably a couple points to parts to this question. We, we know, uh, President Biden has talked about himself as a Zionist and absolutist. I mean, really absolutist in support of Israel. Uh, we also know the position of the Republican nominee for president. So I, I'd like for you to talk about Vice President Kamala Harris and the as the presumptive Democrat nominee, and then also weave that weave that answer into. Uh, uh, the following: Many of us are going to be heading to D.C. in Feb uh, in uh, Wash in, in in September, September twenty third to twenty fifth, just like we did in March. It's the last week that Congress is in session before before uh, they return to their districts uh, to campaign uh, for uh, the upcoming election. What would your message be to our government representatives? So this two part this two part question we're, we're we we have a delegation and we're inviting all who want to come to washington dc september 23rd to 25th and so as lynn talked about it how can we put pressure what should be our message to our government representatives and um ron why don't we start with you i was really hoping i was gonna be first on this one <laughs> um but um you know i was i, I I will say this, those of us in California know Vice President Harris's track record as attorney general and as yeah, a, yeah. I'll say it, a cop, basically, in California. It wasn't the greatest track record for some of us who organize around um, more progressive um, intersectional movements. Yeah. That being said, there is potential to push her in ways that I think she is a, a newer player in the political landscape to an extent. There are ways in which APAC might have some uh, hold on her fundraising, but she's not embedded in that. And so there are ways in which we can invite her into identifying other forms of power, other forms of resources. Um, we are in an election year, and as was demonstrated by um, the uh, undecided campaigns or uncommitted campaigns, that is a way in which we can demonstrate we have numbers. We are the we the people feel a certain way, and so in this moment, are our elected representatives going to hear that? Because we give them that power to be our elected representatives through our votes. And so I think that's one space in which, you know, we can say your voters, this is how we feel. Do you want our vote? <laughs> um, and, and so I think that's one particular place where we can do that. And I, I think another piece of it is, you know, will we change the hearts and minds of uh, Vice President Harris or, you know, locally we've been organizing around Senator Padilla. Um, will we change their hearts and minds with our actions? Possibly. Maybe not. But I think what's crucial is that in doing and having that campaign goal, if you will, we're not just aiming for that goal, but what we end up doing is building relationships with each other and identifying our people and identifying our communities and our power. So whether or not you get a sit down with Harris or her people, you're meeting with your people. You're connecting with your community and your power and your vision. And that is an essential part of this work, whether or not we achieve that final goal. Lynn?
I wish there were easy answers. <laughs> but uh, I think I just would repeat myself. There's power mapping, local power mapping, um, understanding people's positions, what they're most likely, where they're most likely to vote, and then figuring out where they have moved, where if they've moved, where where were those pressure points? Um, it applying pressure is not always the easiest thing for, for instance, people of faith or people who want to just be nice. Yeah. <laughs> There's a big difference between being genuinely compassionate and loving and applying political, political and movement pressure because that requires non-cooperation. That requires strategies of non-cooperation. Um, starting with the Gandhian method, whatever you think of Gandhi, um, the SALT march was pretty uh, impressive. Um, so <coughs> King did it, I mean, and, and the, the entire Black freedom movement. So we are in a moment where we need to strengthen our, our bonds across our sector journalists, academics, faith-based communities. That's what we're speaking to right now. So for the, the what does the faith-based community have? The faith-based community has moral pressure. That moral pressure can also be linked with boycott. And, um, you know, anti being part of an anti-apartheid community means that you know how to work with boycott and divestment and sanctions. The Presbyterians uh, took a long time, but they, and I went, to, I went to more Christian national conventions than I thought I ever would in my entire life. But, but um, divesting as a movement and then not letting that be the end but figure, having a long plan, a longer term plan of where you're going to go and how are you going to get your community involved and keep pushing, you know, the non-committed voter, voters, that was a powerful moment also. And it just kind of rose up. So we just need to be strategizing together um, in the Bay Area since Kamala is here and um is married to a Jewish guy and is, you know, uh, has had Passover and it's, we, we have the potential of pressuring her during the high holidays. And I would suggest that's a, that, you know, whether that's a solidarity movement for atonement, you know, like making, making atonement really big, whatever we're thinking, it has to have a national impact. Allison. First of all, I want to recognize that the past 10 months of protesting in the streets and in the halls of Congress have helped bring us to this moment where we don't have Biden as our representative. So let's name the power of the movement and the work that we've been doing um, and its successes. Um, when it comes to Kamala, I want us to be very clear, I, you know, it, Yes, she will be better in some ways and certainly verbally, but if she is pro-Israel but against the killing of children, if she is pro-Israel but against Netanyahu, the Zionism in her is still going to be guiding her vision and our goal is to challenge Zionism and the settler colonial project of Israel. And so it's not just challenging some of the extreme manifestations, but it's challenging the structural uh, hierarchies. And so, so we need to be very careful when we hear her talking to both affirm what she's saying that's better and really push her to say it's not enough to just stop killing children. The whole apartheid regime needs to end. Settler colonial ne needs to end. Um, uh, and quite frankly, getting rid of not Netanyahu, uh, most Palestinians are convinced that the replacement is only going to be worse um, because the structure is in place. Um, yeah. I uh, and, and and then I I do want to 
I, I think I'm just echoing, but but the role of the faith community to use our moral voice has been effective in the past, and it is essential in this moment. Uh, if politicians know what is happening but aren't doing it, we need to hold them accountable to that. And and whether it's using shame or whether it's uh, demanding that they live up to um, uh, their responsibilities, um, whatever, whether it's boycott, whether it's divestment, whatever tools we have, we need to demand a moral future for this country. I wanna say thanks to uh, Allison and Lynn and Ranwa, uh, and I wanna give them the last word. So, um, Ranwa, let's start with you. Any parting words for us? Absolutely. You know, I, I think my parting words, they come from work that actually uh, came from working with Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity as a, a sort of a partner organization um, in my previous organizing role, um, a phrase that those of us who are people of faith have the power and responsibility to be worldview creators. And so as we're talking about offering that moral imperative to our leaders and to ourselves, what is that worldview we are imagining together? What is that vision and that embodied felt in our bones and our souls? What is that experience of a free Palestine, of a world free from settler colonialism, of a world free of extraction, of a world where everybody thrives, where nobody is struggling to be seen or experienced or treated as a human, as, as a person, of, as an entity of worth? Mm -hmm that we are engaging all of our life and lives and all of us of every element around us with the real reverence that our faith demands. What is that worldview? And if we can ground ourselves in that, it can sustain us in this work because it is going to be long. It is going to be challenging. It is going to be frustrating and devastating. I am not going to sugarcoat that. But if we hold on to that worldview and into that why and into that that essential heaven on earth, as some of us like to call it, that we are here to create together, we can make it through. We can persevere. We can have that sabar, that patient perseverance that I draw on in my Muslim identity. We can we can make that happen if we ground ourselves in that shared worldview. Allison? I, I want to, if you're looking for ways to speak truth, I want to direct you to um, the Apartheid Free website where we have Bible studies, where we have educational materials and resources. If you're looking for ways to take action, we have uh, a very lengthy list of ways to take action. Um, we have a uh, a webinar on divestment coming out, um, and and then very quickly to to my to my final word for this community, wherever there is empire, and empire has always existed. Wherever there is empire, there are communities of resistance, and we are part of a long and rich tradition of people who have done this work before us. May they guide us. And we are a part of a large global network of people uh, doing this work of dreaming and building and birthing uh, structures of humanity, as, as Renwa put it. And so we are in good company. Um, let's uh, roll up our sleeves. Let us hold hands with one another. Uh, let us keep doing the work together. Thank you, Allison. And Lynn, I believe you have a poem for us. Yes, I wanted to bring us back to Palestinian voices. And this is by, uh, from the work of We Are Not Numbers, an organization founded by the martyr Refat Alarir, whose poem has practically become the, the national poem of Palestine. 
he supported children from Gaza to write about their experience. And this is a, a recent reflection by a young person named Sahar al Ishla, and it's called In Search of Myself. Since the launch of this attack on Gaza, I've lost my home, my safety, a comfortable life with income and tranquility. I have also lost myself. For 26 years, I was a girl with a unique personality of joy, simplicity, confidence, peace, strength, sensitivity, and passion. However, the past eight months have shockingly wiped out all of these features I had as if they had never been inside me. It doesn't feel like eight months, more like eight years or even eight decades. I have been counting days, not living them. Life has stopped for 300 days. Lost in the world, ignorant of the present and future, unaware of what's happening around me and how to act, this is how I've been feeling for a long while. The original version of myself is in a coma and she won't return until the war ends. Ending this war, ending the state brutality is our job since the war is paid for by us. One cannot read these reflections and not compare them to the words of other children living with a war against their families and their bodies and their souls. And so we pray for the strength and courage and risk-taking and love that we need to take action until the war ends and a new future sees the light of dawn. Allison, thank you. Lynn, thank you. Ranwa, thank you. Uh, bearing witness, challenging us to action. Uh, we really appreciate the three of you coming on today and for all of you who tuned in today.